Good day to you. Yeah, here it is. Your campus. Beautiful East Stroudsburg University. That's where you're getting your college degree from. I don't know what the statistics are after the pandemic, but before the pandemic, when you break down East Stroudsburg University students by gender, there are more females at East Stroudsburg University than males. It was around 56% before the pandemic, so that's pretty significant. And so that means that more females probably are graduating because I also happen to know that males are more likely to drop out from college, at least in the last 10 years. So we have more females entering the workforce with more undergraduate and graduate degrees. But as women well know, it's not a playing, it's not a level playing field out there. The average woman is going to earn, I think it's up to 82, 83 cents up to on the dollar for the same job that a man performs with the same credentials. So women know full well what it's like to be discriminated against, right? Because there's no way with the increase in numbers of women entering the workforce, with many students in this class included, that we shouldn't be closer to women or at least equal, or I should say at eventually equal. Hopefully that eventuality is not too long. And so that introduces our subject today because we're talking about feminism. We're talking about feminism and feminist analysis. It's a natural step off of what we talked about last time when we studied Sigmund Freud's psychoanalytic theory because sexuality and the way that sex is communicated and talked about has a lot to do with this next perspective that we're taking off, which is feminism. And, you know, a couple nights ago, I watched Dave Chappelle's comedy documentary called The Closer, which is raising a lot of controversies being accused of attacking the LGBTQ community and in particular the transgendered community. I'm going to leave that, the answer to that question, whether he is or not, to you. I mean, comedy is very complicated by its nature. It's supposed to be satirical. One thing that caught me, though, when I watched, when I watched that special was he identified as a feminist. He calls himself a feminist, David Chappelle, and he said that he was surprised to read when he first read about feminism by looking it up in Webster's Dictionary that it is a way of looking at the world that is not relegated just to women. In other words, he was astonished to find out that you could be a man and be a feminist or be another gender identity that you have and be a feminist. And so that introduces that this perspective is, is different from the other perspectives in the sense that it is also a political movement. I mean, we did talk, to, talk about cultural studies as being a, a political movement as well. This is a different kind of political movement. Feminism, it's about trying to make change in society in addition to analyzing how feminism can apply to understanding media content. And by the way, if you're interested in the subject material, there is a women's studies, women and gender studies minor at ESU. It is interdisciplinary. It takes place across several disciplines and departments. My wife is actually teaching the intro course for that next semester. If you're interested, women's studies 150, intro to women's studies, WST 150 is a course. She's the department chair of academic enrichment and learning. Her name's Kelly, and she's done a lot of research in this field, including for her dissertation. Anyway, let's get more into what feminism is all about. So it starts with the differentiation, which most of you know, between sex and gender, right? You know about that. You know, sex is something you're born with, and it's really about your genitalia. If you have a penis, you're biologically born as a male. Gender is, and, and if you have breasts and a vagina, female. So gender is different. Gender is socially constructed. Gender is constructed by our interactions with others in life. We learn to refer to and think of what a male is and what a female is. But in recent times, research has revealed that most people are not at the end of the spectrum when it comes to gender, meaning you're not either completely a male or completely a female, that most people fall along that scale like it's a sliding scale. And they tend to have X characteristics that would be considered male, 
and Y characteristics that are considered female. Those characteristics themselves, though, they're socially constructed. Like, boys don't wear pink shirts when you're young. Well, actually they do in Mexico, but not in the United States. Why? Socially constructed. It's seen as too feminine as a color, of a color, um, some people think. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the construction of gender. And in particular, the last few years have opened up that discussion and presented that there are many different uh, ways of looking at that subject of gender, but that people do fall on some kind of a, a sliding scale. All right, at the core of feminism is essentialism. And the essentialism speaks to gender because it says that gender distinctions are innate. That as human beings, we want to say that women and men are different from each other. And so that's what we're trying to handle here, whether that is the case, whether that should be the case, and what role media texts play in our perceptions of gender, in our perceptions of what women and men should be doing. If you look at TV shows from the 1960s, most of the women in those shows... They're homemakers. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about media texts, whether tell, media is telling it, whether media are representing things or actually uh, reinforcing things that exist, even if they are inequalities. So the first concept that we take on is a concept we've talked about before. It's stereotyping. Stereotyping, remember, that's where you reduce a group of people to one characteristic. It's not that the characteristic is not true in some way, shape, or form. Uh, you could say that country music artists are rednecks, for example. That's a totally, total big stereotype. But there are some dimensions that go along with redneckism, if you want to think of that, that might be true for the majority of country music. I think country music artists would say that. So it's not that stereotypes don't have truth to them. It's that they reduce people. They reduce them to their worst qualities, right? And that's how stereotypes operate. And one of the stereotypes that we have about human beings when it comes to their sexuality and therefore issues related to feminism is what we call binaries. Binaries. You may have heard about binaries. It's become a subject of popular discussion in the news. And we're certainly going to talk about binaries in our next class when we do queer analysis. Queer analysis, another uh, chapter that's similar to the theoretical frameworks of this class and also psychoanalytic theory. So let's let's get to these binaries. So what we're trying to do is smash the binaries, right? We're not trying to say that the world exists either or. We're not trying to say men are either this or uh, or that, or women are either this or that. That's what we're trying to do. So what are these binaries we're trying to smash? One is the active slash pactive, passive binary, where traditionally men have been in the active part of things. They've been portrayed in media content in sports situations. They've been portrayed in media content driving powerful cars, using industrial tools. Men are portrayed as active. Women, on the other hand, have often been portrayed sitting or standing. They've been portrayed often as underweight or overweight. And the focus has been on the physical being of the beauty and the way that camera shots are set up, the physicality of the female. That's a very different way that females have been portrayed. So smashing that binary, that's what feminism wants to do. Make sure that women have the opportunity to be active in, in, in media content and men have the capability to be passive as well. Another binary is the public slash private binary. So what this is speaking about is men are out in the public. They are out doing the work. They are out in the vernacular of very early human being development. They're out hunting and gathering. They're out interfacing with neighbors to make sure the neighborhood is safe. They're out paying bills, making sure that the, the house that is owned is in good stead with the community. Women, on the other hand, they're inside. They're in the home. The male brings stuff home to the woman. The woman takes care of the interior of the house. Okay, this is a binary. The woman in that home is the nurturer, the nurturer of the children, the domestic manager, making sure that things are clean and orderly. That's a binary. I'm trying to smash that binary and make sure that those two sides can mix with each other more to bring more equality to our human interaction. The next binary is the logical slash 
and I know most of the women will love this one if you have the, harbor some misjudgments towards it. It's going to be the logical versus emotional dimension, emotional dimension. I know that Kelly, my wife, in a lot of her research, when men get passionate about an idea in a corporate setting, they're seen as decisive leaders. When women get passionate, they're often called emotional. <laughs> so that's what this binary is about, breaking down, breaking down the idea that men are logical and women are emotional. And then is it the one that I just alluded to a moment ago is the fourth binary, and that's the sexual and the sexual object. And so men are sexual. That's the binary on their side. They are the pursuers. They are in charge. They're the one who asks the woman on the date. They're the one who makes the first move in touching a woman. They're the one who is... And of course, I'm speaking in a lot of heterosexual content. I'm doing that on purpose, as though all relationships are heterosexual. They're not. I'm not meaning to imply that. We're going to talk about queerism in the next class where we develop things in a different direction. But for right now, to illustrate the points, it's, it's portraying the male as the pursuer, the, the person who asks for a hand in marriage, not the female. Women, like I'm implying, are the pursued, which makes them objects, objects of desire, objects that can be possessed, objects that can be taken control over. Uh, there's a great quote by Simone de Beauvoir on page 202. I'm going to reference you too. I'm not going to read it myself here, but it really brings home this point. At the same time, though, Somehow in our culture, the female is more admired by both genders. Is the female not? At least when it comes to sexual objectification? Is not why the female is more likely to be nude in a public place in terms of a statue or a painting than a male? Isn't that why a so-called male fantasy is a threesome, but a so-called female fantasy doesn't get talked about in that circumstance? It's about the woman is more appreciated in some ways. And some researchers have related this back to the fact that it's the woman who gives the birth to the baby. It's the woman who preserves the human race. The woman continues the human race. The baby comes from the human being, so the, human is to be, the woman is to be admired and cherished. That's one of the things that Beauvoir talks about is helps to achieve equality for women, but at least in some senses, but it's also detrimental at the same time. And advertising is notorious in this conversation that we have about feminism because advertising is constantly promoting sexuality to sell products. Advertising knows full well that we have these drives as human beings that we talked about because of Sigmund Freud that we can't control. I name some ways that we can control it in the one class, but other ways just include buying stuff because we think it's going to enhance our sexuality. And by the way, around the world... The standard for female objectification is different. In France, in their advertisements, you will actually see a topless female for a shower gel. I mean, that's a commercial advertising a product where you are naked, right? If you're going to use that product, you're going to be naked. It's a shower gel. So the French have the attitude, let's show the person as they would be using it. That makes sense. It's natural, it's part of life, but at the same time, it's an objectification of the female because you're not going to see a male in the same kind of commercial using deodorant and being naked as well. Now, I guess you don't have to be naked when you use deodorant. All right, now let's go to a period of time we're going to call post-feminism. Because when you look at feminism, there are actually three waves of it, three different waves of it. And now we are in a period of time that we call post-feminism because the original waves happened quite a while ago. So the overall shift of these waves has been to look, instead of at the oppression of women, to empowering women. And I think that's a significant shift because it shows what you can do as, to just, as opposed to focusing on what's wrong. And so the first wave of feminism was in the 19th and 20th century. So it was about 100 years old. And we had activists like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, who was later named on our currency, the Susan B. Anthony dollar. You don't see hardly any of them in circulation, which is a great example of how women are still trying to get rights in all dimensions of human life. They fought for the woman's right to vote, which was finally achieved in 1920. Did you know that, that women couldn't vote in the U.S. until 1920? That's just over 100 years ago that women finally started to get a right. They didn't get that right until like a 
150 years after the country was started. So men had a 150 year running start on women in organizing the country. It may be one of the reasons why we still don't have a female president or have not had one. So that wave finished out and was replaced by a second wave. This is the first wave I became aware of as an adult. I lived during this wave. It was in the 1970s and you had activists in the 1970s by the name of Gloria Steinem, who's still around, and Betty Friedan. And they were focusing on workplace and reproductive rights. Workplace and reproductive rights. So in the workplace, women were stereotyped as being secretaries and service people, and the men were the managers. So those are the, some of the workplace rights. And when you talk about reproductive rights, we're talking about the right to choose what to do your, with your body if you become pregnant. But we're also talking about workplace rights if you are pregnant, which is still being talked about, which is actually something that's in the news right now with the infrastructure bill, the human infrastructure bill. Family and medical leave is being talked about as being dropped from the infrastructure bill. There are disagreements from the two key senators, or at least one of them, about, about whether to vote for it. But that means that a mother who has a sick child would be able to, to care for that child and and not lose pay if they are one of the major earners in the family, which is the case for many families. So that's the kind of thing that the second wave of feminism worked on. We're still seeing that worked on today. And there was this big movement called the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, that was spreading around the country. It was supposed to be a whole new amendment to the Constitution, the newest one actually, giving equal rights to women it did not pass because the Equal Rights Amendment has to be ratified by two-thirds of every state legislature. And I forget what state legislature shot it down, but it did, it did not make it, even though it had the majority support of the country. Well, that wave has now been replaced by the third wave. The third wave is the role of gender in relation to identity. And identity is made up of race and class and disability and other dimensions of your life that feed into how you perceive yourself and how others perceive yourself. So we look at how gender is related to that and whether that is a healthy relationship or not. The whole Me Too movement, that's part of this third wave. It's a big part of the third wave to try and finally blow the cover off the sexual abuse that takes place in Hollywood and in other media type settings. We're talking about media today where women have to go through a kind of casting couch in the, in the most uh, vulgar sense to have sex with directors to make it up uh, through to, su to success, really. And so the third wave looks through media, to, through the Me Too movement and other avenues, it looks how your identity is also related to class and disability. And one of the areas is transgender people who are also black. I mean, the, the people that I've talked to are transgendered and black. They say, no, 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 we have to look at intersectionality here. Intersectionality, what's that? That's not the fact that we are just dealing with being black. It's not the fact that we're just dealing with being transgendered. But we have two things going on, both of which are underrepresented and do not have racial equality or do not have equality in this country. So we've got a double whammy going on here. And that's part of what the third wave is trying to do, and multiply our understanding of what happens in media representations. One of the researchers in this area, Rosalind Gill, she comments on a post-feminist girl with a hairless body, a slim waist, and firm buttocks. She says that's what's still going on today. In other words, the male patriarchy still exists because that is the male sexual fantasy. You can decide for yourself. I know that rap, for example, brought in a whole new way of looking at women with the, quote, big booty. And uh, Nicki Minaj and other performers, Jennifer Lopez, changed the perception of what the female body should look like, at least for, for uh, minority bodies. Uh, that's something for you to consider, whether that has been helpful to feminism or not. So now let's move to wrapping up or talk about feminism with some consequences of the sexist media representation that is out there. Because we do understand that media texts influence people. We, we know that media texts influence people to some extent. Otherwise, you wouldn't have people who are citing that they have an addiction to pornography. Otherwise, you wouldn't have people who are saying that there's too many gun violence incidents that are copying movies. That are You have people saying that people's feelings of sensitivity have been reduced who are also playing a lot of video games you can decide for yourself all of that the point is is that the study of researchers is supposed to look at whether media techs are influencing people in bad ways including eating disorders 
which is something that many females suffer from, many college females actually, and males. A lot of male wrestlers suffer from this, and bulimia and anorexia is binge eating and then and then throwing it up, vomiting so that the weight does, is not gained, but also gorging at the same time. There's a lot of question. There are a lot of questions about whether advertisements have done this, and, and advertisements and just the general portrayal of women with the, the bodies that are commonly shown in media. Whether that's really creating uh, an ideal image of a woman that can never be achieved, at least achieved by the average woman. And a lot of the advertisements they don't they don't talk about exercise they talk about dieting and getting getting onto plans that will still allow you to eat as much as you want and, and and those advertisements again they're exploiting those drives that we have to to look the best to feel the sexiest that we can at all times all periods of our life that's how freudism psychoanalytic city a city also burns in bur, burns into the feminist perspective so we'll finish with the Adonis complex do you know what the Adonis complex is Adonis was the Greek god goddess Sorry, I almost got myself in being anti-feminist here. It was the goddess of beauty and desire. The goddess of beauty of desi- and desire. And so the Adonis complex, it looks at what you are unhappy with, with your body. Like if I asked you what you're unhappy with, with your body, I bet women would answer that question faster than men. And I bet they would be very specific. They would talk about an area of their face, their nose, their mouth. They'd talk about, I may be wrong. But if I'm right, I think it speaks to how media representations still continue to put women in a place where they need to aggressively fight for equalities in all manner of speaking, including whether the woman is being judged according to the same standards of beauty as a male is being judged to and what the effects are if they are not on individual vulnerable people. That's for you to consider in your discussion posts and hopefully throughout life. Have a great day.